Well, today we're joined by Claude Moniquet. He's a former member of the French Intelligence Service. He's also an author and founder of the European Strategic Intelligence and Security Center. That's a Brussels-based think tank specializing on terrorism and security issues. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Moniquet, for joining us today. And you spent a lot of time in North Africa and the Middle East. So looking at the Arab Spring, did you see it coming? Were you expecting this? And how much of it do you think is a product of people going against uh, repressive governments and how much of it, as some governments claim, has been fueled from the outside? I will probably say things which are not really politically correct and uh, very popular. Uh, but uh, first of all, no, we didn't see it uh, arriving. We knew clearly that there was a lot of problems in uh, in, the, in the Middle East and in the Arab world, in North Africa, problem of, of poverty, uh, social problems, cultural problems, problem of the youth, youth without employment, and so on and so on. And we knew that something was burning him. Uh, but we were much more focused on the, probably on the risk of an Islamization than the risk of a so-called uh, Arab Spring. Uh, when it happened, uh, and we, when we saw the mechanics, we understood that it will be a large and, uh, and deep shock, not only for the Arab world, but for all the world. The beginning very clearly was grassroots. Uh, it was the exasperation of young people wanting to have a normal life. If, it's very clear in Egypt, for instance. If you take the Tahrir Square at the beginning, you had very young uh, people, uh, graduates, most of them, most of them helped and supported by the United States. Some of them were trained in the United States, were funded by the United States and so on, with a very clear and very liberal idea of the future. The only sad thing is that it didn't happen in the Western world, but in an Arab country, where the political agenda was different. And we had those people uh, coming from the, the street, but with a clever view of the future, and everything was recuperated at the end of the day by the Islamists, by the Muslim Brothers. So do you see this as a trend in the region where you have openly religious leaders coming into power? I wrote personally uh, before, a long time before the, the, the Egyptian elections that the only possibility is to have the Muslim Brothers as first political uh, formation in Egypt. I mean, everything else was just impossible because you have a very poor society uh, with a large percentage of people who are just not able to read the newspaper, uh, with pe a large unemployment uh, number. Uh, so uh, everything was in place to have the extremists and certainly not a democrat issue in, uh, in, uh, in Egypt and the same in Tunisia and the same tomorrow in Syria. Yes, well, looking at the Syrian crisis, it is complicated and it's far from over. And we heard the U.S. and Turkey talking about studying a no-fly zone. And we've also heard from the French defense minister who said that France is willing to help in looking at this effort. Do you think this is where it's headed, a similar Libyan scenario of imposing a no-fly zone? Actually, very clearly, no one in the leaders of the Western world, no one wants to go in Syria. But maybe at one point it will be possible to avoid it. I don't think so, uh, but it's possible. If we go in Syria, I think it will be a nightmare, uh, but uh, we'll see. Uh, for the moment, we don't see any clear evolution in Syria. It seems that clearly the government cannot win, but it cannot lose. Uh, so for, for the moment, you have just killing after killing and uh, bombs after bombs uh, and no possibility of reconciliation because at the base of the problem you don't have the problem of demo of course you have a problem with democracy in Syria but it's not the main point the main point is a problem with the, between the Sunni and the Alawites which are 10 percent of the population the, the Alawites are leading the country for 20 years, 30 years, and the Sunni, which are 75%, say no, it's enough. We don't want you anymore. But in the mid it's not Luxembourg, it's not Switzerland. In the Middle East, uh, 
today in Syria for the Alawites uh, losing the power, losing the grip on the power, means dying. Uh, and I'm not sure that the two millions of Alawites are really eager to die. So they have no other choice than keeping the power. Uh, with the support, by the way, of the Christians. You have two million of Alawites and two million of Christians. The Christians very clearly in Syria are supporting the power because they fear the, they, they fear to have some problems when the Sunni will uh, reign on the country, like their fellow uh, Christian in Egypt had with the Muslim Brothers and others. Uh, today, and that as the Christian in Iraq had, today it seems to be clear that you cannot be Christian in the Muslim world. Uh, I mean, yes, you can be a single Christian and nobody probably will hurt you. You cannot have a Muslim, uh, Christian organized community with equality uh, with the Muslim and with the possibility to have political uh, activity in the Muslim world today. I mean, in the Muslim Arab world today. Well, despite the tough words that some of the Western leaders and their allies have said in relation to Syria, you still feel that they don't really want to go into Syria on a full military scale. What do you think is holding them back? We know, we think, and our leaders think that Syria could be worse than Libya. And I think basically they are right. Because in Libya we had 6 million people, in Syria we have uh, between 17, 18 and uh, 20 million of people. Uh, we have clearly extremists in Libya. It's the border of Iran. It's between the Iran and Israel. You have the Lebanon, uh, the Lebanon problem, which is not so far. So no one wants to be involved there. The last time we, I mean, Western uh, armies were involved in the, the area, I was there, it was in the 80s in Lebanon, and we lived in Lebanon with the body bags of our uh, fellow soldiers. Uh, 242 American Marines and 62 uh, French paratroopers. I was there this day, I will remember all my life those body bags. And it was not a very nice experience for us. I don't think we, don't, we, we want to, to have this experience again. And if we go there, we have the risk to have this experience again. Uh, we cannot, it's not a game. It's not a, a, a Hollywood movie where the good guy, the good cowboy can come, uh, make everything calm and quiet in the city, uh, killing just two or three bad guys. And after, every, the, after at the end of the, the movie, he kiss the, the, the beautiful woman, they marry and they, they have a lot of children. It's not really the same story. Uh, it's Middle East. It's a very savage war, and after this war, whatever will be the, the, the winner, will be the winner. Uh, after this war, you will have terrible settlements of cones, killing, uh, revenge killing, and so on. And we don't want to be involved there. Well, from the intelligence circles, can you confirm the uh, smuggle of weapons into Syria, as well as the presence of some uh, foreign secret service in the country? Very probably. The arms are coming from Iran for uh, the government, and from Saudi Arabia and Qatar from the rebels. That's clear, I think. Everyone knows it. Uh, and some intelligence services, uh, for instance, probably the British, the MI6, maybe the French, uh, maybe the Americans, are involved at a level or another level in the support of the opposition. Well, on the one hand, you're saying that Western leaders and their allies don't really want a, a military operation in Syria. But at the same time, you're also saying that it's very likely that there are foreign secret service agents uh, in the country already. But that is getting involved, isn't it? What's the difference between a military operation and having your agents on the ground? You can deny. You can deny. When you send intelligence people, even if they are killed, you can say, yes, but I don't know him. He was a tourist or he was a journalist. And I don't know, I'm not involved. The use of the secret service, the main prospect of the use of the secret service and secret agents is the plausible denial. Say, no, I don't know them. Uh, when you are cut, uh, when you are caught with arms, tanks, 
planes, you cannot say, no, it's not my plane. Well, let's talk about Al-Qaeda operating in Syria. Is this true or not? And if so, what can the situation develop into? It's probably very true. Uh, what we know is that Syria, uh, at the time of the war in Iraq, Syria uh, was one of the platform uh, of uh, act action from uh, for Al Qaeda. A lot of people coming from Europe, uh, from Belgium, from France, from Germany, came into went into Iraq through Syria. So it's clear that uh, Al Qaeda has had at the time its own uh, networks there. Uh, it's clear also that a lot of people, we don't know how much, but a lot of people who were involved in the Iraqi war are today uh, fighting with the opposition against the regime in, uh, in Syria. For a very obvious reason. Uh, if you remember, the people of Al-Qaeda in Iraq were killing Shiites, as well as uh, British uh, and American soldiers. Uh, and in, uh, in Syria, the power is a Shiite power. The Alawites are a branch of Shiism. So for the people of Al-Qaeda, which are Sunni of very strict obedience, it's the worst enemy. Uh, and to kill, to kill a Shiite is better than to kill a Christian for them. Uh, so it's a, it's a good motivation for them. And we have clearly people, and we saw also some modus operandi. Uh, I don't think that we have people of Al-Qaeda involved in the, for instance, in the fight in street fights in Alep because it doesn't make sense. But uh, when we had the bomb uh, at the center of the power in Damascus uh, a few weeks ago, it was very likely an Al-Qaeda job. Actually, for the moment, nobody knows exactly what are the different tendencies in, uh, in the in the opposition uh, in uh, Syria. Because when you see, for instance, the people in Paris of the uh, Le Comité National Syrien, the National Syrian Committee, uh, they are very modern, they are very Western speaking, they are very democratic and so on. When you see the people planting bomb, bombs in uh, Damascus, it's another, it's another thing. So where is the truth? What is the real power of the moderates and the Democrats, if they exist? What is the real power of the people of Al-Qaeda? What is the real power of the Saudis? Nobody exactly knows. And we will see it and we will know it after. But when will be this after? Nobody knows. It could be tomorrow, it could be in six months or in two years. Claude Monique, thanks very much for your time. I thank you.